appreciate Professor we appreciate Professor Lammers joining us to give a technical talk as part of our graduate um, seminar series. Dr. Lammers is an assistant professor at UC Berkeley and, and faculty scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and, and a founder of the new comp of a new company for direct air capture of carbon dioxide, um, Travertine Technologies. She has worked for many years on chemistry of carbon dioxide sequestration, carbonate mineral formulation, formation and selective element extraction. Her research spans fundamentals uh, to apply environmental geochemistry. In 2020, she received the Department of Energy Early Career Award to explore non-classical pathways of carbonate mineral growth. Oh, that's interesting. It just disappeared. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, and in 2018, she received the Mineralogical Society of America Award for kinet Kinetic Modeling Work. She has co-authored over 35 peer-reviewed publications and one provisional patent. Uh, Dr. Lammers holds a PhD from UC Berkeley and a BA from Dartmouth College. Dr. Lammers, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Awesome. Well, I'm very excited to be here uh, to visit Texas remotely. I wish I could be there in person, like I said before we started, because I actually grew up in Houston, Texas, and I haven't been back in so long, and I really miss it. So um, hopefully I'll be able to get back there pretty soon. Um, so today my talk is titled Sustainable Resource Extraction and Separation for the Renewable Energy Economy. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, that was a really nice intro. Thank you so much. Um, I, uh, I, my group studies mineral aqueous interfacial geochemistry generally, and we try to do work kind of spit, running the gamut from uh, fundamental interfacial processes to application. And so um, what I'm really hoping to accomplish uh, as a scientist and as a person is to take the knowledge that we gain through our fundamental research and actually make a, a difference in the world. And so um, I'm gonna be presenting to you a couple of different uh, avenues of research that we've been working on in the last couple of years. Uh, the first has to do with rare earth element extraction. And the second has to do with uh, basically changing the way that we make um, uh, acids for uh, extraction of metals, and I'll focus on lithium extraction. And the cool thing about it is that you can sequester carbon dioxide in the process. So um, I'll get to that in a little bit. So this work, the rare earth element work was done uh, in collaboration. Well, Elliot Chang was my PhD student, has since graduated, is now a postdoc at Livermore Lab. Um, and then I worked with a number of folks uh, who are actually bioengineers at the Lawrence Livermore Lab, um, led by Yang Kin Zhao, who is uh, uh, the lead in that group. And then uh, the work that I'll show you in the latter half of the talk um, was done with the assistance of Yang Hua Duan, Luis Anaya, who are PhD students at Cal, Romari Lopez, who's an undergrad, David Jaspi, who's an electrochemist at UCLA, and then David Sedlak, who um, is an expert in electrochemistry and water treatment here in the civil engineering department at UC Berkeley. So we're in a brave new world for energy and resources. You may have seen this figure somewhere, but the last seven years have been the hottest on record. And that is because uh, we are injecting very large amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, approximately 40 plus gigatons per year. And the earth isn't able to um, take up all of that carbon dioxide. So we have um, CO2 concentrations that are accumulating in the atmosphere over time. Okay. Um, and so to avoid catastrophic global climate change, what we have to do is to slow and reduce global warming by reducing our emissions and removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, okay? So to do this, what we're gonna have to do is decarbonize energy and transition to more electrified energy economies. And to do this, we're really gonna have to innovate in every aspect of, um, of our uh, resource uh, use system, okay? Uh, and so what my lab does is uses chemistry inspired by the earth to facilitate sustainable resource extraction and carbon removal. The earth has been sequestering carbon dioxide forever <laughs> um, through what's called the URI cycle, where um, the release of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere through volcanism gets essentially absorbed uh, by the earth through 
silicate weathering reactions. So silicate minerals will dissolve and consume the acidity from um, carbon dioxide and that CO2 will convert to CO3 2 minus so carbonate and it'll precipitate as mineral carbonates which accumulate um, the seafloor sediments. And so that process called the URI cycle, it's basically the thermostat for CO2 in the atmosphere over time. But how do we accelerate that to pull CO2 out? That'll be something that I talk about later, later in this seminar. But um, before that, I just want to kind of like tee up the motivation for the topics I'm addressing here. So new energy, new resources. So rare earth elements are essential components of electronic devices. Um, some of the rare earths are also really important for fixed magnets or, for example, for wind turbines for renewable energy generation. And our demand for rare earth elements globally has been increasing dramatically over time as we use more electronics, as we use more renewables. And most of the rare earth uh, production is concentrated in China, although the United States is a non-trivial producer of rare earth elements as well um, through the monazite deposits. Um, so rare earth elements are also relatively abundant in, in byproducts of fossil fuel manufacturing. That's a, this, is a, um, this is a theme that'll come up a few times in this, in this seminar. So coal fly ash deposits, which are accumulated um, uh, throughout the Appalachians in particular, are rich in rare earth elements. And the question is, can we economically extract those and use those as a source of rare earths? And so um, the question that motivates the research in the first part of the talk is how do we efficiently separate the rare earth elements that we need most right now from mixed wastes? Um, and that the answer to that has everything to do with selective separations of elements. So how do we use surface chemistry to selectively separate from a mixture uh, an element that we want, okay? And the second part of the talk is gonna focus on lithium. I would imagine that most of you have been hearing a little bit about lithium in the news because right now the rush is on to uh, at least double, quadruple, triple uh, our lithium production globally as we transition from fossil fuel-based uh, automobiles to EVs. And um, this is a plot of, uh, lithium demand and thousands of tons, lithium carbonate equivalent, if you hear that unit come up, that means um, tons in mass of lithium as a lithium carbonate, Li2CO3. That's just the standard unit that the industry uses to quantify amounts of lithium that are extracted. Um, now, when they actually go into batteries, lithium is um, preferred as either a carbonate or a hydroxide. So lithium carbonate, um, is a proportion, uh, a fraction of the overall lithium demand, the lithium hydroxides make up the balance. Um, and what we need is relatively pure sources of lithium hydroxide and carbonates for those EV batteries. And so this is a plot of projected demand over time. Um, going from 2020 to 2027, you can see we, we need a delta of about a thousand, thousand tons of lithium carbonate equivalent. So a megaton of lithium carbonate equivalent. That's a lot of lithium that we need to mine. Um, and so the question is, how do we mitigate the environmental impacts of new lithium mining? And so the second half of my talk is going to be talking about lithium extraction from a special type of deposit that we have here in the United States in abundance, which is a claystone deposit, um, and actually coming up with a way to mine the lithium while sequestering CO2 as a mineral carbonate. Okay, so again, just a brief overview of what I'm going to cover today. Part one, selective separation of rare earth elements from wastes. In this case, um, uh, coal fly ash is, a, a, we did a techno-economic assessment, and that is the most economically viable waste product um, from which one could sequester rare earth elements. Um, and then the second half of the talk is going to be related to sustainable mining of lithium, but more broadly into transitioning how we make industrial chemicals so that we can actually sequester carbon dioxide in the process, okay? All right, so jumping into the rare earth element topic. Uh, a number of years ago, my colleague from the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, Yongkin Zhao, who is a, a bioengineer, reached out to me saying that they had um, come up with a genetically modified organism uh, Colobacter crescentis, they can also do this with E. coli, where they change the chemistry of the cell wall um, to add in a functional group or uh, essentially a little chemical structure that has a very strong affinity for rare earth elements compared to other metals. Okay, so um, they engineered Colobacter with 
rare earth binding proteins or lanthanide binding tags, what they're called. Um, and these uh, rare earth binding proteins, again, have high affinity for rare earth. So if you have uh, exposed this, this organism to a, a solution or a waste mixture that has a mixture of metals in addition to rare earth elements, calcium, magnesium, iron, um, uranium, all these different things, the colobacter will preferentially uh, absorb or adsorb the rare earth elements. Okay, and so they came up with a process where basically their engineered organism would interact with the rare earths, and then you would elute the rare earths and reuse the organism um, to continue the cycle of rare earth element extraction. And what they showed in their original research back in 2016 was that uh, terbium, which is a, a kind of middle um, weight rare earth element, um, sorption to their DLBTX4, so there are four copies of the lanthanide binding tag, uh, per um, outer cell protein on here, they, they showed that their engineered organism could absorb more than twice as much of this rare earth element compared to the control uh, organism. Okay, so they reached out to me and said, okay, so we, we can do this, but the question is, how do we predict the solution conditions under which um, this organism best pulls rare earth elements out of mixed wastes? And also, how do, we, uh, how do we promote sorption or uptake of the most valuable rare earth elements? Because not all rare earth elements are created equal. I'll, I'll go into the list of them in a little bit. Okay. So um, I personally didn't have any background in biosorption before working on this project. Um, I am much more familiar with surface chemistry of inorganic materials, minerals, carbonates, uh, clays in particular, phosphates as well. Um, and so this, this was new territory for me, but it turns out that bacterial cell walls um, have surface proteins that um, have functional groups on them that are familiar to me from uh, surface chemistry of inorganic materials. And so one of the main surface functional groups on the outer cell wall of, for example, an E. coli bacterium is a carboxylate group, COOH. It's essentially a, a carbonate group stuck to a surface. Um, that's the termination of a calcium carbonate mineral, for example. And so there are similarities. Um, additional types of sites that are uh, typical of the wild type organism would include uh, hydroxyl sites, phosphoryl sites. So all of these different functional groups um, can absorb or stick to metals. Um, in addition, Yang Kin Zhao's group had engineered these surfaces to express rare earth element binding proteins. And so when you actually measure absorption of the rare earth elements to these organisms, what you're actually measuring is um, a sum of the rare earths sticking to the engineered protein, but also rare earths binding to the negative sites, okay? And so there are many surface sites on these bacteria that are available for sorption of metals um, and rare earths, essentially rare earths and their competitors, but only a few of these sites are highly selective for the rare earth elements. And so what we wanna understand is the conditions that optimize separation, which would mean we want to drive most of the absorption to those highly selective sites, okay? And so if we look at a, a chart of kind of qualitatively um, what sorption would look like, this is a plot where we have the log of the rare earth concentration on the x-axis. So as you go from left to right, we have increasing concentration of rare earths in the aqueous solution. And then on the y-axis, we have the concentration of rare earth elements that are actually stuck to the surface. And that could be in units of, for example, moles or mass of rare earth per mass of um, the bacteria. Okay, so that's the solid associated rare earth elements. Now, um, when we have a, a mixture of metals and solution, we're trying to selectively separate that rare earth from waste. Um, at very low rare earth concentrations in solution, what we would expect to see is that the surface um, would be occupied by those rare earths only on the highly selective sites for the most part. And there would be only a very small contribution from the low affinity site types. So those native um, carboxylate, phosphoryl, hydroxyl sites. And then as you increasingly load the surface with rare earths, so we increase the concentration of rare earths in the system, 
um, we would expect that all of those rare earth selective binding sites would get saturated with respect to the rare earth. So everyone would be occupied by a rare earth element, so you can't add any more. So any additional adsorption of the rare earths to the surface then would, um, would occur on the native sites, the sites that would happen on the non-engineered bacteria. Okay, so that's kind of qualitatively um, what you expect to see. But the question is quantitatively, how do we um, come up with a system where we can recover the most rare earth, rare earth elements at the highest purity? Because there's a trade-off um, between the most recovery and the highest purity, okay? And so to do this, what we do is take inspiration from um, surface chemistry, geochemistry. What geochemists have been doing for many years to understand partitioning of contaminants and valuable elements in natural systems is creating what are called surface complexation models. Um, I don't know, are any stu students in here? Are any, well, I don't see anybody. So um, I'm gonna assume that you're not familiar with surface complexation models. Um, surface complexation models essentially um, assign a chemical reaction to each type of site that you think exists in your system. So for example, if you think of a heterogeneous sediment, it's got quartz sand, it's got clay, it's got some iron oxyhydroxides. Each of those different phases has a different affinity for different metals um, from one another, okay? And so if we wanna, for example, predict the transport of a metal like arsenic in, uh, this is not a metal, uh, a species like arsenic, arsenate, arsenite, in, uh, a, in a groundwater, for example, then what we're gonna have to do is understand specifically the affinity of the arsenic species for the individual surfaces. And even at higher resolution, each individual surface has different site, site types. So we, we kind of zoom in on the, the sites that are available and write an explicit chemical model for the sorption of that arsenic or whatever metal species we're interested in to those surfaces. And so this is a tool that we use all the time to predict, again, contaminant transport, selective recovery now, but also uh, nutrient transport in soil. So this is a widely used tool in the geochemist toolbox. So what we did to start out here was developed a surface complexation model for rare earth element biosorption. And rare earth elements uh, exist as trivalent ions in solution. So it's essentially the element to the three plus. So it's a highly charged cation. And it's kind of nice because there are many different rare earth elements in the lanthanide series, but they all have very similar chemical behavior. So that's an advantage to us because we can build one model that will work reasonably well for all of them. So when we build this chemical model, we start out by identifying the types of sites that can sorb metals on our surface. So we construct a list of the dominant um, proton and metal, metal dissociable functional groups. So these are essentially those surface sites that can grab onto a metal that are naturally occurring. Okay, so the dominant ones include the carboxylate, phosphoral, hydroxyl, and amine surface functional groups. Okay, so these are all proton dissociable. So if you add acid to a suspension of these microbes, then these sites will each absorb protons. And that can tell you something about the relative amounts of each site type, okay? Um, what Jonkin Zhao's group did was add in this additional site type, the rare, uh, the LBT, lanthanide binding tags, the, rare earth specific functional groups. And the nice thing was that since they're bioengineers, they know precisely how many copies of this lanthanide binding tag they added to each outer protein. So that was a nice constraint that we had to work with, okay? So these are all proton dissociable groups that can absorb rare earth elements and any other metal that's in a mixture. And then um, rare earth elements can form complexes dominantly with this, uh, with these LBT, these lanthanide binding tags, selective groups. Uh, we also said that they could form bonds with carboxylate groups, which was supported by some spectroscopic evidence, okay? So um, putting this surface complexation model together, we could then um, conduct adsorption isotherm experiments where essentially you have your suspension of this microbe with a solution of known amounts of rare earth elements and you incrementally add more and more rare earths and see how much of that rare earth is adsorbed to the cells. 
um, and measure the surface excess, which is the amount of rare earth that is stuck to the microbe um, as a function of the equilibrium rare earth concentration. So that's what's shown here. So the blue curve is the wild type, the red curve is for the engineered uh, surfaces, and it's about double desorption capacity there. Okay. Another interesting uh, thing that we can do with this modeling is parse the relative proportion of rare earth elements on the rare specific functional group, that LBT site, versus all the other uh, surface sites on the microbe. So this is percent terbium absorbed. So terbium, again, being our kind of model rare earth element as a function of the equilibrium concentration of that terbium in our aqueous solution contacting the microbe. And at very low concentrations, most of the terbium sorbed to the lanthanide binding tags. And then at higher terbium concentrations, we have this trade-off where all those LBTs get saturated, the lanthanide binding tags get saturated, full of rare earths, we can't add any more. So all the, the rest are added to carboxylate groups such that the fraction of rare earths sorbed to carboxylate eventually becomes dominant. Okay. And so, um, if we want to actually make a predictive model of rare earth element sorption, we need to constrain uh, something about the surface chemistry. And specifically, what we need to know is the total amount of each type of surface site. Okay. And so we do that using what are called potentiometric titrations. And these titrations measure essentially how microbial surfaces buffer the pH. Okay. So actually, there's a question in the chat that I did not um, see until just now. So um, Jen Pingju says, after the bacteria absorb the rare earth ions, do they precipitate from solution? Very interesting question. So um, it turned out that we did see some uh, very adorable little um, rare earth precipitates forming on some of these microbial surfaces. But for the most part, the plan is to saturate the surfaces with rare earths and then add in um, an eluent that would strip the rare earths off again and then precipitate it out separately. So it's more straightforward to separate um, the rare earths uh, in that way. So it's essentially a living adsorbent material instead of a, uh, an inorganic or passive sorbent material. Okay. All right, so here we are constraining our surface chemistry. So the um, data, so this, I won't get into details of this, but this is, Delta sigma H. It's essentially um, the change in surface protonation as a function of pH as we add in base. So let's start out with a pretty acidic suspension. We titrate in some sodium hydroxide and we see how the surface buffers the pH. Uh, and our data are black there. And then our um, model fits to the data are shown in curves. If we assume a one site model, so we just say there's one surface site type, maybe one carboxylate type, um, we get a very bad fit. We add two, we get a better fit. Three and four are essentially indistinguishable. And so we need constraints from spectroscopic tools to say whether or not there are uh, additional important site types contributing there. And so we fit these data constraint, the number of dominant site types and their corresponding amounts. And so here we have a three site model for carboxyl, phosphoryl, and hydroxyl site types. Um, comparing the pKa, so this is the pH at which half of the sites are deprotonated, meaning they lost their proton, for the wild type or certain native sites versus the engineered uh, surface. And so the good thing is the pKa's are the same, which is what you'd expect because it's the same site type. So the pKa's are, are very close, but the fitted site types are different. So for the engineered strain, we uh, see greater concentrations of every surface site type. Um, and that may be more because we're actually expressing more uh, surface proteins in these engineered bacteria. Okay. And so now I want to talk a little bit about how we can use these chemical models of the surface to help us selectively separate rare earth elements. And maybe I should have given this intro earlier, but the rare earth elements are um, in the lanthanide group, and they also include um, scandium and yttrium, which are um, higher up in the periodic table. Um, again, they have lots of similarities with respect to their uh, speciation. So in aqueous solution, they'll all be essentially in a three plus oxidation state, uh, but they're not all created equal in terms of their applications. And so um, we typically like to separate light from heavy rare earths. The heavy rare earths in general 
have more are more valuable and have more applications in industry. Okay, so um, th that's you know not 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 completely true. For example, neodymium is really important. You've probably heard of a neodymium magnet. It's a permanent magnet which we need for um, for wind turbine turbines and, and other things. And so um, even light rares have have important purposes, but what we need to be able to do is to separate them. And when you have a geological material that contains rare earth elements, essentially the ore source, typically many of these rare earths are mixed together. And so it's important to be able to separate them so we can actually use them in their various applications. Okay. And so what um, our colleagues did at Livermore Lab was set up a column experiment where they loaded the um, modified E. coli, the bioengineered E. coli, into pegda beads, um, these polymer beads. So they essentially had a living absorbent, and they packed those resin beads into a column, and then they flowed a feedstock through that was enriched in a, a mixture of all the different rare earth elements to see how they separate on the column. And so we developed a model for this uh, rare earth element separation um, that was informed by our knowledge of the rare earth elements relative affinity for uh, the different surface sites. And so this is a plot of the rare earth element um, purity percent. So it's essentially the fraction of sites occupied by a given rare earth element as a function of time in this column experiment. So this is the rare earth element that is actually on the resin beads. Okay, so at the start of the experiment, um, there's no rare earth element total, uh, and they are relatively equally distributed in, in terms of what is actually absorbed. And then over time, there's some separation taking place. Once we break through, and that would be we have uh, essentially 50% of the initial influent concentration coming out of the outside at the effluent of the column. Uh, once we break through, uh, we get maximum separation where the heavy rare earth elements are favored on the surface and the light rare earth elements tend to be released relative to the heavy. Okay. What we found though is that there is a trade-off between surface selectivity and recovery. And so just looking at a single pair, europium and lanthanum, so europium is heavy, rare earth, lanthanum is a light rare earth. If we want to get that europium, um, then what we want to do is maximize the surface selectivity, but we also don't want to lose a bunch of it, right? Because as soon as we break through, the, the composition of the eluent starts to look a lot like the composition of the influence. So rare earths are being lost, okay? And so um, using our surface complexation model, we could determine um, essentially percent europium recovery and the europium to lanthanum concentration on the column material to get to a point where you could optimize recovery, but also separation. And so optimal recovery and separation, depending on which one you're trying to favor here, might happen somewhere at breakthrough, essentially, where we still have um, good recovery. So most of it will be absorbed to the surface. Um, and we are not losing too much, excuse me, we're not, um, we're not uh, contaminating, contaminating too much our europium with lanthanum. So we still have a relatively high uh, ratio of europium to lanthanum. Again, if we let it go longer, then we could have a surface that has more europium than lanthanum, much more, factor of 3x, but then we would have lost a significant fraction of our total europium. And so the nice thing about developing these chemical models is you can figure out optimal conditions um, to optimize for, you know, essentially um, uh, revenue in the case of trying to selectively separate uh, rare earth elements, right? So we want to, we want selective separation, but we also want to get as much as we can of this stuff. Okay. And so just to summarize and batch, the heavy rare earths prefer the bioengineered site. And that's what leads to that behavior that I showed on the previous slide. So this is um, experimental data are shown as the green vertical bars here, the absorbed concentration to kind of the beads in batch mode for the different rare earths are shown on the left. And then the percent contribution to uh, surface sites of the different rare earths is shown on the right, and that's a model output. So the left is a model compared to experiment of the total absorbed concentration, and the right is the site contributions uh, model fit uh, to get this behavior. And essentially, 
to reproduce the experimental data, what, what has to happen is the engineered bacterium has to have a higher affinity for rare earth elements than the, excuse me, heavy rare earth elements than the native groups. Okay. All right, so conclusion for this part, um, surface chemistry and the tools we take from uh, interfacial chemistry and geochemistry can help tell us where rare earths prefer to absorb on surfaces, so specifically which types of sites, the chemical conditions that enhance selective separation of the rare earths, and then um, chemical conditions in the solution that can help enhance separation as well. So one thing I didn't get into is essentially different compositions of competing metals and also the influence of the solution pH and how that influences recovery and separation ability. But once you have an explicit chemical model for various surface complexation, you can actually um, come up with model scenarios that explore how rare earths might uh, prefer to be absorbed under those different conditions. Okay. So that's the wrap up of my first part of the talk on rare earth elements. And I wanna transition now uh, to talk about lithium, which is another critical uh, element that, again, has been in the news, all over the news, at least in California. <laughs> I don't know about in Texas, but we hear, we hear about it a lot on the news in California. So um, lithium, again, is a key ingredient of batteries for electric vehicles. And the question that might come to mind is where do we get it now? So conventional resources for lithium have long dominantly been Sol solar evaporation ponds. So these are essentially uh, evaporated basin lakes in very, very dry regions, particularly the Atacama Desert, South America, um, where you end up with uh, salts and brines that are very elevated concentrations of lithium. Um, at the same time, we can mine uh, lithium silicate ores. Uh, spodumene is a lithium silicate mineral that is the main ore uh, body for lithium in the US, so southeastern US now. And, and then also there's a lot of uh, spodumene in Australia as well. So uh, breaking down here, the global suppliers of lithium, uh, Chile has long been the dominant supplier, again, because of the solar deposits in the Atacama. China is also uh, a leading supplier. And then Australia, spodumene, US, suffice it to say, is sitting towards the bottom. However, in recent years, we've started looking for lithium and lithium is one of these metals that is um, in everything, right? But at very small concentrations. And so we, what we wanna find is unconventional reserves of lithium that are the highest possible purity. So you have to do less separation, okay? So one lithium source that is receiving a lot of attention right now is lithium brines. And these contain, uh, it's thought, to be around 10 megatons lithium carbonate equivalent. Remember that plot of lithium demand that I showed you at the beginning, we need at least one megaton additional LCE per year by 2027 to meet our uh, lithium demand for EVs, okay? So the Salton Sea Geothermal Brine, this is located at a geothermal or hydrothermal system in California, Salton Sea, and it's being tapped by a number of different um, a number of different companies control thermal resources, Berkshire Hathaway Energy, Energy Source Minerals. And what they're all trying to do is selectively separate the lithium from that brine. But um, what I got more interested in was the sedimentary lithium deposits. So uh, the reason for that is it's a much, much bigger reserve. So sedimentary lithium deposits are uh, found in the basin and range, essentially, Mojave Desert all the way up to uh, the southern border of Oregon, Nevada. And these deposits are thought to contain hundreds of megatons lithium carbonate equivalent, which would be plenty of lithium to essentially electrify all vehicles uh, on the planet. And uh, the main resources include Rhyolite Ridge, which is uh, 60 megatons lithium carbonate equivalent, and Thacker Pass, which is more than 10 megatons lithium carbonate equivalent. So just zooming in a little bit more on these uh, lithium reserves in the Western US. So the lithium is bound in a clay mineral called hectorite. Uh, hectorite is a, a sodium silicate, it's a clay, where lithium substitutes for magnesium in the crystal lattice. So that lithium is structurally bound to the lithium, excuse me, the lithium is structurally bound to the clay, the hectorite clay. And so to get the lithium out, 
the dominant method for a long time has been sulfuric acid extraction. So that's, that's, the, that's the mainstream method for lithium extraction from pectorite claystones. Uh, on the right here, I'm showing a map of the Western US. Oh, there's a sliver of, of Texas here showing a gigafactory, right? Elon's jumping ship <laughs> for Texas. Um, so there'll be more opportunities, right? In your, in your neighborhood. Um, so one of the gigafactories for uh, manufacturing Tesla batteries is in Nevada, very close to many of these very, very large uh, claystone deposits that are concentrated up here at Thacker Pass and the McDermott Caldera and down here at Rhyolite Ridge. Okay. Um, and so what I mentioned before was that the standard method to extract lithium from claystone is by a sulfuric acid leach and sulfuric acid is used for many, many things. And um, the amazing thing about it is it's the most used industrial chemical in the world. We use over 200 megatons of sulfuric acid per year for various applications. Um, the number one application is in production of phosphate fertilizers. So we take sulfuric acid, react it with rock phosphorus to produce phosphoric acid that goes into mono ammonium diammonium phosphate. So our main agricultural phosphorus fertilizers. Okay. So the byproduct of that is a ton, well, ton, gigatons, I should say, of gypsum, calcium sulfate. Okay. So sulfuric acid, again, most used chemical in the world. And again, another uh, fossil fuel byproduct shows up. So the way that we get sulfuric acid now is by oxidation of fossil fuel derived elemental sulfur. Maybe some of you know more about this than I do, but essentially they take sour crude and refine it to remove the sulfur so we don't get acid rain, right? Um, and that uh, sulfur ends up in these big yellow piles um, that then get trucked to wherever sulfuric acid is needed. So typically sulfuric acid is made on site wherever it's being used through an oxidation process that's been around for over 100 years, essentially. Okay. Um, at the same time, of course, we're facing a need for permanent carbon sequestration solution to sequester CO2. We need to do exactly what the Earth has done over geologic timescales, which is a little bit of acid based chemistry. So, um, what I mean is a rock would con consume acidity and generate alkalinity that would convert carbon dioxide into a carbonate, okay? And so what I have done for many years is study carbonate mineralization. So this is an SEM image of adorable little calcite crystals, calcium carbonate, uh, but of course other carbonate minerals can form as products of silicate weathering and that sequester carbon dioxide over geologic timescales. So the question is, can we accelerate this? And in the, in the meantime, make an important industrial chemical product, okay? And so what we did in my lab was develop a new process for making sulfuric acid that can permanently sequester carbon dioxide as a mineral carbonate on a mole for mole basis, meaning for every molecule of sulfuric acid you make, you sequester a molecule of CO2 as a carbonate. And this was my provisional patent. This is what I'm trying to commercialize now uh, because now is the time for <laughs> direct air capture and CO2 sequestration. And what, what got me into this and, and tuned into this topic uh, was learning about the gypsum calcium carbonate replacement reaction. And so uh, it turns out that there are massive limestone deposits in the rock record that were formed originally from a calcium sulfate deposit. So you could imagine evaporate um, so drying out lake bed, you precipitate out a bunch of calcium sulfate, and then some change in the hydrologic regime exposes that to an alkaline solution. And that reacts with CO2 from the air to form a calcium carbonate. And so a number of folks have studied the gypsum to calcium carbonate or calcite uh, replacement reaction. Uh, these are some scanning electron micrograph images of that replacement reaction where we have the gypsum as the, the large crystal in the back, essentially, with these little tiny crystals of V vaterite, C calcite, and ACC is amorphous calcium carbonate, the G is the gypsum. Um, so the, all of the calcium carbonates are forming on top of that gypsum. Um, so the bottom here, zoomed in again, we've got our little vaterite almost burrowing its way into the gypsum crystal with this calcite crystal. And it's an amazing replacement reaction because it's a negative volume change. So as we dissolve the calcium sulfate to precipitate the calcium carbonate, some of that, um, 
some of that uh, volume decreases. And so uh, the reaction can proceed to completion. Okay, it doesn't seal itself off, it just keeps going. And so in this process, we release sulfate, and that is an alternative source of sulfur for sulfuric acid. And so what we've done in my lab is essentially shown that we can take gypsum and carbon dioxide from the air to make calcium carbonate and sulfuric acid to use for extractive industries um, by adding in uh, electricity. Okay. And so the application that was essentially inspired for is uh, lithium extraction from these sediments. So we would add the sulfuric acid to our clay stones, take out lithium sulfate, cycle back in the leachate, which is mostly going to be magnesium sulfate. And then we don't have to add any more gypsum. Now we can just produce a magnesium carbonate solid. Okay. So in my lab, we, we made a, a, a little system there and we tethered an electric chemical cell for doing acid-base chemistry to a reactor where we do our precipitation dissolution. Um, and then we measured the rate of acid production. How quickly do we make sulfuric acid? How quickly do we make, uh, do we consume um, alkalinity and make carbonate minerals? And then we looked at the solid transformation products. Okay. And so um, I'll go through this quickly because I'm running up against time, but essentially um, we showed that we can, so this is analyte pH. This is our sulfuric acid over here. And depending on the current we use in our electrochemical cell, we can make acid faster, which would mean a faster pH drop. And then depending on the current and the relative size of the different reactors, won't get into it, we can show that we can actually buffer the pH on the cathode side and keep, maintain essentially a steady state pH. And so um, we've measured the rate of acid production as a function of current in our electrochemical cell to show that we can control that. And also, and we measured the sulfate using elemental analysis to show that it is indeed sulfuric acid, okay? Um, and then we studied the carbonate mineralization kinetics. So the rate of carbonate precipitation is plotted here as a function of our rate of addition of base from that electrochemical cell. And what we show is that we can transition between regimes. So on the low base flux, which means that we're operating our electrochemical cell at a, a lower current, so we're not, not doing as much acid-base chemistry, basically we're adding base in slowly, um, the rate of carbonate mineral formation is limited by the base flux. So for every mole of OH we add, we precipitate immediately the carbonate. Um, on the other side of things, when we operate at a higher current, our carbonate mineral formation is limited by the supply of CO2. So we hit a wall that is like the maximum amount of CO2 we are bubbling through our system. Okay. So we can essentially modulate the rates of base production and flux of air to control the rate of carbonate uh, mineralization. So the key thing is, you know, if we want to achieve, basically replace the way that sulfuric acid is currently made with a new process that is uh, based on uh, electrochemistry, then it has to be efficient, right? And so what's plotted here is the measured energy intensity of acid production. So uh, kilowatt hours per mole of sulfuric acid produced at different currents. And then what's known as the Faraday efficiency, which is basically saying how many of the electrons that are transferred actually go to acid versus acid base production. Um, and so for our process, um, we're finding that the energy intensity of acid production, even with opt without optimization of anything, uh, any electrochemical parameters, we are achieving energy intensities close to the chloralkali process, which is the leading industrial process for bleach uh, making and sodium hydroxide making, essentially. And so this, this process has been around also for around 100 years, but it's a really good industrial analog as a goal to shoot for. Um, and the Faraday efficiency is around 80%, which is really good. So most of the um, electrochemistry that happens translate directly into forming acid and base. Okay. And we've done some um, high level economic analysis and find that um, we could theoretically create, rather produce sulfuric acid and in a cost competitive with commodity price, uh, which is really a key parameter here because carbon markets are still uh, immature, right? And so we can't really rely on selling carbon credits to subsidize making sulfuric acid in this new way. So instead, um, we have to be able to sell sulfuric acid at a competitive price. And we think that we can actually accomplish that with this method. And for every ton of sulfuric acid we produce, 
we sequester a, a less than half a ton of carbon dioxide, okay? So an application for this then would be lithium extraction in Nevada, one of those clay stones, which it turns out is very close to gypsum mines. Those are shown as these little triangles here. And so we could um, extract the lithium and these lithium mining companies are paying an arm and a leg for sulfuric acids, their biggest operational cost for lithium extraction. And at the same time, we could sequester the carbon dioxide that they're releasing as they, um, as they react the, the sulfuric acid with clay and will even sequester more CO2 than that. So theoretically, those um, carbon credits would be permanent and sellable, okay? Um, but looking forward into the future, I mean, you could even think of um, using this process to enhance weathering. The earth is the limit for carbon dioxide removal. So you could enhance weathering of, um, of ultramafic rocks, for example, and accelerate the formation of carbonate mineral products. Here's a shown a, mag a massive magnesite deposit. And so if we could leach silicates with a process that's inspired by this, um, we could unlock gigatons per year scale of carbon dioxide sequestration potential. Okay. So just in conclusion, um, we use geo and biomimetic surface chemistry to inform new methods of sustainable resource extraction and also carbon dioxide removal. Um, the first part of the talk was about rare earths and microbial bioabsorption. Um, those surfaces provide a nice platform for engineering surface selectivity towards specific elements, in this case, rare earths. Um, and then my group has always studied mineral growth and dissolution. These reactions can be coupled with electrochemistry to make and recycle chemicals in a new way um, that could enable essentially gigaton scale CDR. Okay, that's my talk. Thank you very much, Professor Lammers. We appreciate your talk today. I want to give an opportunity to graduate students first. Are there any questions from our attending graduate students? Don't be shy. Any graduate students? All right. I see faculty are interested. Dr. Mahanti, do you have a question? Yes. Um, wonderful talk, Laura. Thank you. Um, my question is, um, can you tell, tell us a little more about how the E. coli's are expressed with those peg DA beads? Um, and uh, that's my first question. Second question is, how do you uh, deserve things? You talked about absorb, absorbing things. How do you deserve the things? Yeah. Yes, great. So as far as embedding the microbes in the pegta beads, I, I don't have um, a really sophisticated knowledge of this process. I know that Dan Park did a lot of work to make it work out, but essentially they bioengineer the microbes and culture them and grow them first, and then they embed them in pegta. So I could, I'm happy to send you a reference that that goes into some more of the details of the engineering. <laughs> that's, that's fine, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then as far as the desorption, what they're using is uh, citrate for desorption. So they, okay. they tried a number of different uh, species, but citrate is great because it complexes the rare strongly and, and had the best uh, recovery. And then that could be recycled again. Uh, okay. well, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Other questions? Can I, ask, can I ask a question? Please go ahead, Dr. Torres for dinner. Excellent, excellent talk, very uh, inspiring. And I recognize the difficulty of some of the experiments that you showed. For consultancy uh, samples that you showed, uh, have you been able to reproduce that in the laboratory with the uh, high temperatures? Uh, so you mean the salt and sea geothermal brines? Yes, yes. So we're so the the application that I was talking about here is actually more along the lines of the claystone extraction because the salt and sea geothermal brines are um, the lithium's already dissolved and so the way that they're approaching separating it there is with what's called direct lithium extraction or DLE where they're um, introducing a selective sorbent and so there's a new company called Lilac that came up with this proprietary. Um, manganese carbonate absorbent material that they're gonna react with that brine to pull the lithium out selectively. Um, but it doesn't really do a good job of separating lithium from magnesium because lithium and magnesium have the same ionic radius. And so they like to, they like to hang out together. And so um, 
so essentially you have to pre-treat to remove the magnesium in that case. Um, the, what I was showing there was essentially uh, the, the, the sulfuric acid production and the carbonate mineralization process that would be used for the uh, lithium extraction. And, and uh, if you were to apply these to not salt and sea, but let's say uh, mammoth, I mean, uh, um, what's the other one, the geysers field, mm -hmm. is it, um, you, you would find a different chemistry altogether in those fields, right? because people are trying to extract lithium all the time from geothermal deposits mm -hmm. but there are as there are significant differences i mean you go to yellowstone you have one kind of mineralization if you go to geysers is a different one but uh, so these these models that you're showing are only pertinent for salt and sea correct well so um the yeah so the different um the different chemistries are really important for selective separation. And, and I, I don't I didn't show any models of separation for salt and sea geothermal brine specifically, although there are folks at LBL who are running that in the in the lab. Um, but the salt and sea geothermal brine is uh, <laughs> it's amazing. It's an amazing, very salty brine. It's actually full of carbon dioxide, so it releases a lot of carbon dioxide also. Um, that's one thing they don't tell you. Um, but the the thing about those brines is they're really 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 rich in manganese which is also hard to separate lithium from so there are some challenges and separations there as far as the geysers um I, i'm not aware of that being a very high lithium concentration so salt and sea geothermal brine has a really high lithium concentration something like 400 ppm uh, which is why that is kind of the target for um for these companies that are moving into this space okay. and i and i just uh, if you haven't realized there's a there's a the question, similar question on the chat about this. Yeah, so, th so there are two questions. So the first is, how is the rate of conversion of calcium sulfate to calcium carbonate? Do you have any idea about the mechanism? So great question. Um, calcium sulfate, gypsum, uh, is very reactive. And so the solution equilibrates really fast with that. And so the, essentially the rate limiting processes could be um, essentially the supply of our ingredients, right? Bubbling of CO2 uh, or uh, addition of alkalinity through base, or it could be CO2 hydrolysis because to go from gaseous CO2 to, um, to CO3 to minus, which is what forms calcium carbonate, you have to hydrolyze the CO2. So it dissolves in the water and then it um, breaks the water, hydrolyzes uh, to make a carbonate anion. Um, so that could be the rate limiting step or um, the carbonate mineral precipitation step. And so what was kind of striking to me when we did these experiments was that um, we could explain all of the kinetic data by uh, a simple, basically two constraints. On, on the one hand, low base addition rates, the rate of adding hydroxyls to the system. So as soon as you added hydroxyl, it got consumed to make CO3 to minus. Um, and as we increased the, increased the, the current essentially, we would um, get to a place where as every molecule of CO2 that we added got immediately converted into carbonate. So that was the case where we were limited by the CO2 supply. Um, as far as the mechanism of replacement, it's a dissolution precipitation reaction. And there are a number of papers that have gone into detail on gypsum replacement by calcium, calcium carbonate. And it's, it's really cool. It's, it's essentially an interface coupled reaction where you have a thin water layer between the two phases. You have dissolution and precipitation happening right at that interface. And so um, you don't actually even need to have that much water around for this replacement reaction to occur. Um, so that's really cool. And you also um, tend to have the carbonate forming by non-classical pathways, which means that instead of going from the gypsum to the most stable phase, which is calcite, you would go through first an unstable phase, like an amorphous carbonate that would then recrystallize again to the more stable phase. So that's um, what we know about the mechanisms. Um, let's see here. Why we didn't include lithium and oil field brines is another source. Yeah, so absolutely. Uh, lithium and oil field brines is another potential source that is being uh, developed. I should say what I had put on there are uh, considered reserves at this point that are actually being actively developed by different companies. I could be missing something um, there. So if, if you know of oil field lithium brines that are being developed, um, certainly I would not want to exclude that. Yeah, I think that's going to be really important. 
All right, the pre people ask questions. Dr. Franks and Am Ahmed Reza, are you guys happy with your answers? Any further questions? Yes, sir. I'm very happy. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you very much for your questions. I see we have a question from Professor Ravi Kumar. Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, thanks for the great talk, uh, Professor Lammers. Uh, I, I think it's the first time I'm, I'm listening to a CDR talk uh, that's a co-benefit of a production process as opposed to an end in itself. Um, my question is related to some of the economic analysis that you've done uh, that you showed before. Um, have you thought about what is the production rate you would need for break-even operation? Um, in other words, can this process be used as a demand response, especially in high noon solar areas like California and Nevada? So as far as production scale of sulfuric acid to achieve break-even, even, I, I believe you would need uh, a plant on order uh, 100 tons plus a day. And so these are not massive, but they're not small. Um, so you wouldn't want a little tiny one-off at a water treatment plant, for example, but um, you could imagine building a number of these at the different claystone deposits to meet that demand. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? I have a quick question, Professor Lammers. What was going on with uh, with rare earth element production between 2001 and 2011 from <laughs> the chart. What happened in the US? I have no idea. Um, good question. I, yeah, would be, that, that would be something interesting to look into. I it, Did it just go away? <laughs> I think you were looking at it more carefully than I was. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I, yeah, I think depending on the price on a product, I, I think mines go on and off with commission, right? Yeah, so. So, so and let me ask one more question. Sure. Is this gonna be part of solving the problem? Like when we look at the annual production of carbon dioxide in and release in the US, mm -hmm. what percentage could we ramp up to? Like what's the total, um, you know, the ultimate uh, possibility here? Yeah, so if we replaced all sulfuric acid production today with this process, then you could sequester something like 100 megatons of CO2 per year. So, you know, by 2050, you sequester something like two and a half gigatons total. Um, and so the IPCC has said we need to sequester something on order two gigatons per year uh, to the end of the century to get to, um, you know, 1.52 degree warming scenarios. And so this would be, you know, 5% of that. So it's not the whole solution if you're producing sulfuric acid as a co-product and selling it. Now, if you wanna go and take the phosphogypsum piles that have accumulated from um, fertilizer production, there are gigatons of that all over the world. We go and sequester those, that adds another um, you know, five or something gigatons. And then if you wanna go in and do enhanced weathering, then that was my last slide, it's the earth's limit. It's like, how much, how much does carb carbon dioxide cost and how efficient can we get this process? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? I think we're about out of time. Professor Lammers, thank you very much for the great talk, interesting topic, and spending time talking to us afterwards. Um, next time, you'll definitely have to come back and visit us in Texas. <laughs> That'd be great. Thanks for having me. All right, thank you.